Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This is Interiors with your host, Alexis Dixon on Bella V TV. I'm just jumping in today to make a quick intro for an extraordinary man, an extraordinary talent who I actually grew up admiring. Uh, this gentleman, Phoenix Norman, um, is just, I thought I did a lot of things, but this guy wears like every hat under the sun. He is an author. He's been a dancer. He's been a, a vocalist. He's toured the world. It's going to be an exciting time learning about him. Uh, the first time I really, I really fell in love was seeing him perform in a jazz group in Logan High School. I won't mention what year that was. And then <laughs> after that, I went back to watch him in a production of The Wiz. We've been on stage many, many times in the past, and Bella V TV is about community. It's about keeping people grounded, keeping people together. And I think one of the common denominators with us, Phoenix, is being a creative and having dance and the arts as a central role in our life. Before I pop off, one of my questions that I hope you answer is being a creative, right? It's, it's a double-edged sword. We love to create, but then sometimes we can't stay with one thing because we have so many things to check off the list. So thank you so much for coming on. I'll leave you two at it. Um, always hella proud of where I'm from, the Bay Area and Alameda. And without further ado, please meet Phoenix Norman on Interiors with Alexis Dixon. Phoenix, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. How are you, Alexis? Very good. So nice to meet you. We met only actually about a few days ago through mm -hmm. Amanda. So this is essentially our first time meeting. Indeed. Having a chance to speak. In looking you up and learning a bit about you on, on Google, um, what I discover is that not only do you do not only do you wear many hats, you're many things. <laughs> <laughs> <What part? laughs> and so you have this ability to shift in between all these identities, mm -hmm. right? As a CEO of a brand development. Um, you're an author, you've written a book, um, which I'd love to talk to you about. You've been a dancer, a stage actor, you've traveled globally, and you're constantly creating. What's that like? For me, it's lifeblood. Um, you know, it's funny how Amanda um, talked about being a creative. I mean, it is a double-edged sword, uh, but I, for me, it's been really my motivation in life is to always create and to always find, you know, a different way or a different, um, a different route to a solution. Uh, that's sort of been the, the secret sauce, if you will, for my professional life. Um, I tend not to follow that very analytical route to answers. I've always been, you know, very creative and, and, and sort of establishing what those answers are, or at least, you know, my pathway to them. So that's, you know, I've sort of applied that to everything I do in life. You know, what's the more creative route than the expected or, or the anticipated? Um, and, you know, with starting multiple businesses at the same time during a pandemic, <laughs> um, with, uh, you know, singing and being, writing a book, these are all things that I've always wanted to do um, throughout my life. And, and being a creative has helped me do that, you know, because it's, it, it's funny when I find that creatives don't really follow convention. They, they, they always try and find a way around, again, what, what the sort of norm or what the expectation is. So it's been great for me. Yeah, it's interesting because whenever I think of creativity, I, I always think of it as a form of expression, mm -hmm. right? And when you said, I, I've used my creativity as a, as a way of finding solutions to problems, I thought, oh yeah, that's right. It's not only a form of expression, it's also a way of actually, outside of the linear aspect of addressing an issue, right? Exactly. Kind of step-by-step -step approach. Mm -hmm. Creatives have always been one component. In fact, society has been moved by creative solutions, uh, creative processes towards finding solutions and answers to problems. Absolutely, because I believe, again, I mean, creativity comes from heart. You know, it comes from sometimes the unknown. Um, I think we fall into these patterns of having to explain everything all the time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not necessary. Sometimes there doesn't need to be some sort of analytical solution to a problem. Sometimes just feeling your way there is the better solution. And for me, I operate on feel. I've been highly intuitive my entire life. And it's just something that's just comes innately to me like that that 
that form of finding a solution, for instance, is innate to me. Being analytical and, and, and you know, trying to map my way there and doing the sort of linear route is highly non-intuitive to me. Um, I'm, I've been become really, really good at it, of course, as a, as a, a multi-business uh, owner, but um, feeling my way through any situation in life has always been my, my default. And I, I refuse to change that. <laughs> it's, it's worked out pretty well. Thank you very much. <laughs> so. I'm glad you say that you depend on the other side of your brain as well, because you are an author yeah. and you became an author after you were a professional executive assistant to some of the top executives yeah. in not only in America, but in the world. Can you talk about that experience of being an executive assistant? For me, it was something I sort of fell into. Um, you know, I won't go through the, the entire backstory, but it ended up that, you know, someone had fired their EA quite loudly on, on a trading floor when I was in investment banking. And uh, I had been sort of cheating and, and correcting a lot of his work because he was a terrible writer. And I, I, I'm as a representative of that, of that particular company, I was working in a typing pool. And I remember I was just like, wow, how are they making all this money? And they can't write a sentence. Like, what the hell? <laughs> so um, so I, uh, I was doing a lot of his copy editing. And I remember he came screaming into uh, the typing pool I was in. And you know, who's been come? Who's been like editing my stuff? Wah! You know, and of course, everyone like gives me up. They're like, he's right over there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, great, I guess I'm fired today. And sure enough, uh, he's like, you know, do you want to get out of this hell hole? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, I need an assistant, as you know. So sure enough, I ended up becoming an assistant with him. And there started a treadmill of being an assistant. It was during .com 1.0. So it was just bank after bank after bank. And each move that I made um, on feel was, you know, really about following the top bankers, following the top deals, that sort of thing. So it, it became this almost uh, addiction in a weird way. And, um, you know, obviously when .com uh, 1 busted, um, then it was a matter of just sort of scrambling and trying to find, you know, I still loved being an assistant um, just because of it. it's, it's just all encompassing work. And it gives you access unlike any other, to be honest with you. Bird's eye view, especially when you're, you're teamed up with a really amazing executive, you have access to the world. The same world that they do, you have access to, it, even though there is a hierarchy that obviously you fall within. So as my career progressed over all those years, I just, you know, I kept jumping from person to person, essentially. You know, my brand was built on their brands, if that makes any sense. Person and to person, meaning executive to executive. Executive to executive, yeah. you know, industry to industry. Like I've worked in, you know, for the, for instance, the, the president of the Levi Strauss brand. I've worked for um, the head of uh, a gentleman who's creating the next um, commercial supersonic airliner. I've worked, you know, literally two feet away from Jack Dorsey for two years. Um, it's, it's that, you know, really sort of aligning myself with people, specifically executives that I felt were really having a, a true impact on the world in some way. Um, and I luckily was able to sort of get in, you know, get my foot through the door and actually have them take a chance on me. So it, it worked out yeah, well. Not, not only did you get your foot through the door and have them take a chance on you, you really then became an author and wrote a book about yeah. the power of being a very professional and successful executive assistant. Can you talk about what led you to write a book about? Because when we think of executive assistants, we think, well, you've got this powerful guy who has this assistant and he, you know, she or he does their schedule and perhaps in the old days got coffee or, but you don't really talk about it in respect to owning it as a profession, perhaps not some time back, but certainly now we do, we see it differently. But long story short, you saw something about the power of this position and wrote a book about it. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. I think everyone's always sort of had uh, a misperception of executive assistance. Uh, thank you, Hollywood. Um, you know, we've always been sort of like, you know, white, fe white female, you know, of a certain age, uh, the coffee getters, the ones who are like, chilling around the, you know, the water cooler, gossiping about, you know, last night's TV program, that sort of thing. And I never really approached that, the role that way. I've always seen it as literally a, um, a partnership between that person and their executive and making sure that 
me as, a, as, as an executive assistant, that I was learning every move that my executives made, really understanding the business, really understanding how they had an effect on, you know, the company's metrics, where our departments actually fit into, you know, the, the, the entire construct of business, and, and really understanding how they made their moves. I was always fascinated with how millionaires became millionaires, and now how billionaires became billionaires. I, I was always sort of fascinated with what's the secret sauce? Like, what is the key? What are those one, two, three things that these people seem to have that no one else can quite figure out? So maybe that was sort of my motivation as, a, as an executive assistant was to be in the room as much as possible to really, you know, with a, a microscope, watch how they moved who they, um, you know, what circles they moved in, the decisions and the types of decisions they made, the language they used, all of that. So that's really maybe what kept me motivated all of those years. So the book for me was really just sort of a, you know, a, 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 a tale, like a very truthful, very blatant tale about um, my experiences, you know, specifically, but also what I saw in business, like some of the maladies that I saw around like inequity, for instance, you know, I, I sort of, and I think I predicted um, this whole work from home paradigm. Um, I talked about, you know, my years uh, working uh, during those, those really hard times. I talked about my two hospitalizations for what were thought to be heart attacks because of stress working in those environments. Um, you know, all of that stuff, if you will, really helped me craft a story that helped to hopefully dispel a lot of the the bs that was out there about executive assistants we truly are a force i honestly think that executive assistants are critical to the success of the people they support even though people still see them as coffee getters and conference chair straighteners and all this other bs um sure if you want to believe that feel free but we one thing i've learned is we operate as like ninjas we get introductions that no one else can get. We have access up and down the chain and we create relationships up and down the chain that a lot of executives don't even have. Um, and we know pretty much everything that's going on, the, the top ones of us at least, know everything that's going on with any organization and can truly be the one resource above all others um, as to you know really the health of an organization and, 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 and sort of be harbingers of what's to come. So the Did book for me- Go ahead, finish, finish. No, 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 I was just saying the book was easy. It was easy to write. It was, uh, and a lot of people, it was very eye-opening. You know, I have a lot of executives who reached out and said, well, I did not even know. Interesting. I'm so sorry. I had no idea. And I'm like, don't apologize to me. You got an executive assistant. Write that bonus check real quick. <laughs> you know what I mean? Come on. Did you share with the, any of the executives at the time that you were working with or had associations with that you were writing this book? Or did you keep the book on the tabs until it was released? As far as I'm concerned, it was none of their business. You know, I, I tried to dumb it down enough where it wasn't giving, you know, any, definitely not any specific uh, secrets of particular companies away. Um, it was literally just calling out behaviors or things that specifically happened to me. And as far as I'm concerned, that's truth. Um, I'm under so many NDAs <laughs> over a 27 year um uh, a 27 year uh, career and I'm really aware of what I can and can't say. Um, but for the most part, uh, everything that I said in the book is, you know, it was cleared by the NDA because none of it was uh, too specific, if that makes any sense. So, um, so I, I think I told actually one, possibly two of my previous execs and they weren't nervous because they knew the quality of my work and they knew that I wouldn't blast them because I actually loved them, you know, but there's a couple I'm sure that, you know, if they've read the book, <laughs> they're probably not too happy with me, but you know, the truth hurts sometimes, especially when you're acting like an idiot. So deal with yeah. it. Who, who was the best, and, I'm not, and don't give names, mm -hmm. but who was the best executive you'd worked with and what was the characteristic mm -hmm. of that executive? Oddly enough, I'd say, <laughs> you're going to laugh at this, uh, the, my favorite executive is someone who, who is now my business partner in, another, in a business that, I, that I'm CEO, COO of and co-owner. She's the other co-owner and she's also the CEO. So um, I loved her just because she, she was the first executive to really allow me to like spread my wings as far and as wide as I chose. Um, you know, she, we were working um, for this one gaming company that was my first foray into gaming. And I was actually put there by a, a venture capital firm that I was actually working for. They were a portfolio company. And the portfolio company sent me to them saying, you know, 
I don't know what's going on over there, but it's a hot mess and I need you to go over there and fix it. So I'm like, uh, okay. So I ended up working with them for a bit and then they, she hired me away. And the first order of business was, for instance, you know, um, opening up a new office, finding a new office and helping to negotiate the lease, getting a um, turnkey within a very sort of short amount of time. And she basically gave me free reign. You know, she knew I had some design ability, uh, all of that. So I literally designed it. I, I ordered all the furniture, hired all the, the contractors. Uh, I painted the walls. I put, what, at the time, 62 chairs together myself. <laughs> you know, I did the entire thing and, and made it turnkey. And sure enough, you know, we walked in, everything worked, thank goodness. And thus started a, a different relationship that she and I had. Um, also, I, I ended up... Um, the uh, the agents, or excuse me, the uh, the property manager would walk prospective clients through our office because it was just so different than anything else and really, really beautiful, super modern. And I ended up getting extra gigs, sort of like side gigs for Saturdays and Sundays where I'm just like working 10 hours Saturdays and Sundays. Um, but I got like maybe six or seven different um, people who moved into the, to the building. I designed all of their offices as well, made a ton of money. I walked her, my boss at the time, through every single one of them. She's like, why are you working for me again? Like, this is crazy. So she actually helped me start my very first business, which was an, um, a corporate interior design firm that I had for about three years um, before, of course, the next, you know, mark, the market drop hit. And that was, that was the end of that. But um, it was great. And it's funny, we ended up randomly meeting up in uh, Toronto. I happened to be up there teaching. And she was up there teaching as well and um, hit it off kept in touch. And then um, Gift Suite, which is uh, the company we have together, uh, kind of fell into her lap. She asked me to partner with her. We did. And here we are, you know, business partners. Can you tell us, you know, as I'm listening to you speak, so many things are coming to mind. First of all, um, did you come from a business family? Were, were your mom and dad in business? Did they, what did you get this business sensibility for? The funny thing is, I think it sort of developed over years and, and definitely as uh, during my career as an executive assistant. My mom was like a top selling corporate or commercial insurance agent for a company called Chubb for um, what, 30 years. So, you know, she was sort of my idol um, around business. She's like, she was such a badass and, and someone that I really, really admired. Um, my stepdad worked for the state. So he, you know, he was less kind of corporate and businessy that way. Um, so it was really my mom who was sort of the inspiration around business more than anything. But I think really cutting my teeth came from working in investment banking all those years and, and being an executive assistant. And like I said, watching my, my executives like a hawk and absorbing like just popcorn. It was like <laughs> absorbing every move they made. And uh, it, it's paid off. It, it literally moving from executive assistant to CEO was seamless. Like, I don't even know how to explain that. It, it, it was like really no pain points because I had already learned all of the acumen that I needed in order to run a company well because I'd seen it um, for a number of years being run well and poorly and everything in between and able to sort of cherry pick the best of. So how are you as a boss to your executive assistant now? I don't have an EA. I feel so sorry for that poor child <laughs> when I do hire one because my standards are way too high. So um, everyone's laughing at me. I have, I've got a lot of people sort of lined up, you know, waiting for me to make that move at some point. And it's actually around the corner because I am I'm running literally what this is business three that I'm running at the moment and I'm looking at potentially starting a fourth and I I'm overwhelmed. So yeah, there's going to be someone there's going to be a little queue <laughs> waiting to, to, you know, be tortured essentially. So <laughs> I know I'm going to be like probably written up in a book myself as being like, you know, this big ass, yeah. you yeah. know, yeah, like, uh, exactly. I see your executive assistant writing a book. I oh, to, oh, totally. They totally will. You know, it'll, I'm hoping it'll be because I've made them the, a multimillionaire. But, yeah. you know, who knows? You know. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you take everything you've done and bring it into a business setting? Do you have to leave some aspects of yourself behind in order to really focus on your business that you're in front of right now? Or you know, do you then leave one identity, move into the next, and then move into the next, and there's no residual... Yeah. aspect of that self and are you okay with that or is it an integration of all of them you know the funny thing is my number one hero um is jack dorsey and the reason why i say that is he he gave me the best training ever uh working in such close proximity with him and really kind of watching his moves and um the fact that he's you know 
CEO of two multi-billion dollar companies and kind of watching him navigate, you know, his personality, his time, his energy, his focus among two really, really, you know, big, important companies. Um, I thought, well, hmm, if he can do it, um, and he's an engineer, you know what I mean? <laughs> Sorry, all the engineers are going to be like, what do you mean by that? Um, <laughs> but What do you mean by that, by the way? I, I say that, and I, I actually laugh. Um, engineers tend to be very analytical. Like, they, they tend to need explanations for everything. But the one thing about Jack that I love is he's also, he's, I feel like he might be an empath, but he also has a very artistic energy about him. Like, everything that he does is around art. And, and feel and he's you know now obviously he's like you know he's been to I call him like a mini monk he's he's been to like every possible you know retreat you can get your hands on I'm sure um around you know um um being you know sort of really conscious and and um aware self-aware and but again you know to your question I I find that yes I do sort of need to navigate between you know something that's highly uh, like my the company Nixon Bow that I have, which is you know luxury candles, and that's going to be expanding into uh, these very sort of minimalist luxury products. Um, that thing requires a different type of me, if you will, like a, a very sort of artistic right brain side of me. Whereas Gift Suite is also a little bit more more artistic, but there's a very sort of um, analytical component to that really understanding my marketing, really understanding our demographics, really understanding our business, um, our business plan and models and marketing and all of that. Um, and then the, the third business obviously is Tribe, which is um, my, my business of executive assistants from around the world, 13 countries, uh, and really sort of helping them grow um, both in their, in, in their uh, profession, but then also just grow as professionals and, and really find a way, like my sinister plan is to make every EA that I come into contact with a CEO at some point, a business owner at some point. Like that's always sort of been my, my goal because I believe EAs are natural leaders. They're natural business owners. They're natural CEOs. Um, but they just lack, you know, some of the business acumen, you know, the sort of little bits and pieces and, and tweaks and certain education, that sort of thing. But it's stuff that we, you know, we have in spades. Um, so, sorry, I hope that answered your question. I'm kind of yeah, little... yeah. I, you know, because um, the, you, you do so much. And as you were mm -hmm. speaking, I was thinking, I'm going back to what you had said earlier in respect mm -hmm. to Thank You Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, the, the look of an executive assistant is usually a very pretty, white, young, assistant who is there to cater to the needs of the CEO, exactly. not so much inform him or not so certainly not on parity with him. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually a him. Right. And yet here you are, a, a black male, gay, mm -hmm. um, multi-talented. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like for you to get into that, to be in that world, yeah. be radically different than what we think of as the model of the executive assistant. What were the challenges that came with that? And what was the benefit that came with that? I think for me, the challenge was just getting in the door. Like that's, you know, that's the one thing that I learned quite quickly is that I didn't fit the mold. And, right. and outside of even being a gay man, mm -hmm. you're oh, yeah. a man and you are a man. And yeah. Most, yeah, yeah, it's a 95% female profession still um and i've heard in no uncertain terms many a time i don't want a dude you know i've heard i've had you know um agencies uh recruiting agencies actually tell me that oh, he doesn't really want a guy which is highly illegal you're not allowed to say that obviously but you know i don't give a shit <laughs> oh sorry i don't care i mean i think for me it's just like just you know just tell me the truth that's all i care about because i can go around my life has been about going around and the one thing i will say about you know, really kind of going into this profession and falling in love with it and, and, and not taking no for an answer is that I felt, I always felt that I could offer something different. Um, it's easy to hire, you know, the same person over and over and over and unfortunately not get a different result. So my shtick, if you will, or, or what I felt was my uniqueness was the ability to not kind of fall into a lot of those, you know, um, uh, very misogynist, um, uh, very race heavy conversations just because I, I, I 
didn't really fit me, to be honest with you. You know, I'm not a woman, so I don't have to deal with misogyny. Um, I might be black, but you know, sometimes a lot of them were looking for the diverse hire, let's be honest. So um, it allowed me in a weird way to really kind of stand out and to offer something different and to, you know, even if anything, just like, let's just try it. You know, I've had the same EA the last six times. Let me try something different. And I gave them something different. I gave them a true business partner. I gave them someone who was just as hungry as they were, who, who knew the business just as well as they were, or as, as well as they did. I studied everything and everyone. I knew all of their connections. I knew everyone that they should come into contact with. I was able to get them uh, introductions to people they never had been able to get introduced to because of the years that I'd had. So I was able to really give them something that was, you know, didn't even know existed. And every move that I made, I was able to do that. And yes, I did run into some who were just, you know, would much rather have one, what did one of them say? Uh, you know, would much rather have a, you know, a hot chick with a, a big rack. Like, That's not I, you. he literally said that to me. I'm like, okay, you're clearly drunk. <laughs> so first of all, I'm going to let that one go, even though I could go screaming to HR right now. But, um, you know, so it, for me, I, I, I knew the game. That's really what it came down to. I, I really knew what was up. But did, did, I, I refused to be victimized by it. Did any of them ever find that intimidating? Because not only are you multi-talented, not only do you do, do, you do your homework mm -hmm. and do it well, um, there's a force about you. There is a there is a force that says, "I'm here. I'm going to be visible. I'm going to I'm going to matter." And uh, there's a part of it that says, "I'm going to be your equal. I'll be a partner. I will play my role." Mm -hmm. Was that ever intimidating at all to any of the people you work with? Absolutely. I've you know I've I've had quite a few jobs. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Um, and a lot of them were because of just that intimidation factor. You know, when I came in, like for instance, the last, the last role that I left um, as an executive assistant, it, the main reason I left was because the executive that I was working for was starting to kind of strip away my power, if you will. Because I, when I came in, I mean, I ended up moving, you know, halfway across the country for this, but I, when I came in, I'm like, okay, here's what I'm looking for. I, I want to be sort of like a low-key member of your leadership team. Um, I will help you succeed in ways you don't even understand, but I need access. And if you give me the access, if you give me the empowerment, if you back me up, I promise you, I'll make your life so easy. All you need to do is focus on what's to come. That's it. So I did that. I became, quickly became, you know, oh my God, who is this kid? You know, leaders are saying, they're like, okay, first of all, why does he dress better than our entire leadership team? You know, <laughs> this is supposed to be like a jeans and t-shirt situation. And he's coming in here in a tie every single day. Like we look stupid. So of course, everyone levels up their, their look. But there were a few times where, you know, for instance, we, I remember we were working on like OKRs and I, I was running it. And he, I, I made a, a mention of something. And I remember after that meeting, he pulled me aside and he goes, so I kind of wanted to be the one to say that. So I'm going to need you to kind of like let off the gas a little bit. He's like, no, no, I don't want to like, you know, like ruin your flow or anything, but yeah, I'm still the CEO. So I kind of need you to kind of pump the brakes a bit. And I'm just like, oh, well, okay. You know, I, I'm not here to like, you know, it's not a pissing contest for me. I'm here for you. So you tell me what you want me to do. But then it just became worse and worse and worse. And after a while, it was just like, okay, well, I'm not here to calendar, you know, only do your calendar and only, you know, schedule your travel and all of that. It just got dumber and dumber. And I'm one of those people, luckily, I've built enough of a reputation as an executive assistant um, and also just a professional that I can... I can make two phone calls, send two emails, maybe a glass, you know, a, a bottle of champagne, and I have a job, like in two, three days, you know, paying exactly what I want with exactly what I'm, what I'm looking for. So I don't, I never let sort of moss grow on my backside. Um, and it's been that way my entire working career. So yes, I've had, you know, my, I say my resume looks like Swiss cheese, but every single move that I've made has been a very specific move and with a very specific agenda. And uh, so I'm, I'm really proud of what I've done. You know, you, one of the things you said earlier, uh, and as you speak, I just feel this extraordinary energy. I mean, I, you know, I knew you were a dancer, you have been on stage, and I could just see you as a dancer exploding on stage, you know, just dominating your space that you're in. And one of the things you talked about earlier was this, I've, I'm, I've gotten good at going around. I know how to go around. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how much of that was part of a survival um, strategy for you, 
as a young gay man and what um what was required for you to be a young black gay man in a black community and a global community right, right. and in the different iterations of your life can mm-hmm. you talk about that and need to go around because you've said that several times mm-hmm. you know doing was that you know what did that come from what was the need for that i think for me it came from i grew up on a farm in texas uh, and at the time that I grew up, the, it was sort of, you know, just post-segregation. Um, so I've always had to grow up, quote-unquote, knowing my place, if you will. Mm. Um, but I've, I get it from my mom. She's the same way. She's that, that same person. I'm so glad I'm a, a chip off of her block. But um, I've always tried to figure out ways to subvert the system. And when I say subvert it, not, not you know, in a, in a nefarious kind of way. It's mainly just... I, I don't like the word no. Um, I, maybe that comes from dancing and going to a million different auditions and having people tell me no for no reason. And, and I, that's one thing I always hated is, as a dancer is you go to these auditions, you murder it and they tell you no, and you don't have a reason why. And I just, that never sat well with me. So as I went into my professional career, I thought, well, hey, you can tell me no, but unless you give me a good enough reason to, to really understand why, then for me, it's just like, okay, well, next, next idiot, you know? <laughs> so I've always sort of um, had this drive to, to prove people wrong, but not, not just for the sake of proving them wrong, but more because I believe people fall into these, these patterns of saying no to things that are un- uncomfortable for them, even though they know it might actually be the right move. Mm-hmm. And for me, I've always been, you know, I'm competitive by nature. Maybe that comes from the dancing as well. And I also used to um, play sports. I was a, like a tennis player um, who wanted to be a professional tennis player at some point. But um, I've always, I've always been a little competitive. I've always wanted to sort of prove people wrong and, and show that, you know, I am the best option. And if you don't choose me, you're a fool. And, um, and I've proven that over and over and over again um, throughout my career. And, you know, I don't, it's, it's, I'm sure that's where it comes from is, is just growing up in, in, in the South and, you know, having to navigate race um, in a very real way and, and from a, a place of survival, you know, mm-hmm. say the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong person and you end up strung up on a tree. I mean, that was my reality when I was a child. So I, I learned quite quickly how to navigate within a construct that wasn't really designed for me to succeed. And I found ways along with, you know, each little subversion <laughs> um, along, along my, my path to figure out a way to, to find a success that was my size, you know, mm-hmm. what I deem successful, mm-hmm. not what other people do. Not, you know, success for me isn't making a billion dollars, even though I'd love mm-hmm. a billion dollars. But, you know, that's not success to me. Success to me is being able to look myself in the mirror and feel good about what I've done the day before. That's my success. So I've been able to sort of manifest that time after time after time. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I don't know why when you were speaking, I, 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 so I see words in um, images. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, I saw Michael Jordan. And I don't know mm-hmm. why Michael Jordan. I love that guy. He's okay. incredible. He's so incredible. I, I, yeah, I saw him and I wondered as he was speaking, mm-hmm. um, uh, are there times you feel not lonely, but alone? Mm-hmm. Do, do you know what I mean by that? I do. I do. Yeah. Can you separate those two and talk about those for you? Sure. I think um, I call it high achiever syndrome. Um, yeah. I call it uh, high achiever syndrome. Uh-huh. Um, and the reason I say that is a lot of people, for instance, Michael Jordan's a perfect example. Um, he just had a, like this whole series on, on TV, uh, uh, the ESPN series, 30 for 30. That's and um, it was incredible because I think it really gave people an idea. You know, people have this sort of, image this persona of who he is you know this super achieving great in the clutch leader you know but you also saw the people who you know were his haters uh some of the people who simply hated quote unquote hated him just because he was better than they were um who you know, he also, you know, while he was bright and smiley on camera, there were times when he had to get down and dirty and raw and kind of tell you like it was, you know? And I think a lot of people don't realize, um, especially with overachievers, is we're, we're kind of alone a lot. We're alone with our thoughts. We're alone um, kind of being um, looked at in a certain way where, you know, we're alone, um, obviously, sometimes in our achievement. 
And whereas most people would see that as like a, a positive, sometimes it's quite negative. It, it can be depressing. It can be, you know, someone say, um, some, uh, what did they say? Oh, this is the best quote ever. I think they said, you know, no one ever told me that, uh, you know, being, being, you know, essentially being great at something is, is like moving yourself onto an island. You know, there's, there's not many other people at the table that, mm -hmm. that are at that same level. So, you know, I don't want that to sound conceited. It's not that at all. I'm quite confident in my abilities. Um, and I realize that there are people that are even better at things than I am. But, you know, for me, th the loneliness, oddly enough, I've dealt with it for so long that it's like second nature to me. I don't really think twice about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, for instance, maybe that's why I started Nixon Bow, like Nix, my, the candle company. You know, I, I always have to find outlets that, that work, you know, that allow me like a, some sort of creative. When I can get back into a creative space, I don't need anyone else because my creativity is mine. It comes from me. It's inspired by other people and other things and environments, but it's 100% mine. And I don't, there's, there's no, you know, obligation or any sort of, you know, dependency on anything other than, than what I feel. And so the loneliness that you speak of, that's how I, how I've always been able to be okay. Um, yeah. Just because I don't, I don't, it's the one place I can go that's me. One hundred. Yeah. yeah. And it feels like, you know, it's interesting. And, and I'm wondering why did Jordan come to mind as I'm speaking with you, you know? And I think as you were continuing to speak here, there was a game that Jordan was saying when he was just on fire. Mm -hmm. The boy would run down court, throw something up behind it, right? Think and it all. One particular game he was in, and this came to mind as he was speaking, um, where he was on the court and he was on such fire, he pulled up right after half court, jumped up, shot a three-point, right, nothing but net. And he turned around and he looked at Phil Jackson and he went, kind of like, I don't even know what the hell is. Uh, it's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that was a really good, you know, so good yeah. Gatorade, because this is a mess I'm happening here. Me, I'm watching me do this mm -hmm. myself. Like, hey, <laughs> I'm just, I'll keep singing okay. them. You know, I, it's... I love, it's the dance. I, love, yeah. I love the dance between my aloneness or my loneliness mm -hmm. and the need to express. And as I'm speaking with you now, I think what came to me was... When Jordan was on the court, that expression of his, what we will call greatness, right? Mm -hmm. But of his craft, of his art, was where his sweet spot was, mm -hmm. right? So he was in relationship with this thing that he expressed. Mm -hmm. And as you were speaking about your aloneness or loneliness in respect to that, it seems to me that when I'm giving expression to something I'm gonna call a creative force, I'm in this zone. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. you know, the language I use for that is I'm with myself. I'm exactly. in the space where I'm in relationship with all the elements, right? The hard work, the practice, the study, and all this culminates into this moment where I'm in relationship with the elements. And so I'm not alone or lonely. Does that sound? It's 100%. It's Right. I mean, I, I even I'm glad you brought up the, the Jordan um, example. You know, the one thing that I always sort of maybe clued in with him specifically is he looked most comfortable on court. He looked quite uncomfortable off court. Um, yes. But when he was on, on court, you can see, like, for instance, in that, that example you, you mentioned, you can see the artistry around yeah. what he's doing. It isn't just about basketball and dribbling a basketball and running up and down the court, sweating mm -hmm. and all sorts of stuff. It's not that at all. When you are in the zone and when you are expressing yourself, you know, all of those connections, that sort of, you know, um, eye, hand, mind, body, you know, geometry, um, like all of those things, physics even, you know, all of those things just become one so that you know that everything that comes from literally from the ground, the ball bouncing into your hand, you know, you going up, you know, literally your body by probably memory from all of those years, going up to be able to release a ball with just enough flip of your wrist that you know the second it leaves that last little iota of your fingertip, it's in. And it's probably all net. Or it might be a little bit off, but it's definitely going in. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that's, to me, the ultimate <clears throat> expression. And guess what? 
no real forces. I mean, obviously you've got blockers and defenders and stuff like that, but no real forces. It's still all, it still all boils down to you and your connection with yourself and all of your faculties in order to actually exact um, the result that you're looking for. So I just, I, I always, I loved the bulls at that during those years, by the way, I was like obsessed, but I loved that he was such a different cut than anyone else on that team, because I think he had mastered expression, his self-expression, he had mastered it. And I think that's why he was such an inspiration for everyone else on the team, just because uh-huh. they, they yeah. really, you know, they wanted that. And they yeah. didn't quite have it. They had it to an extent, but not like that. And I think that's yeah. really why, why they did such, so well, because they were trying to please him. They were trying to emulate him. And that's, that's basically why they did so well and became a dynasty. I, I love the term that you just used, mastered expression, mm-hmm. you know, because oftentimes we think it's something that's kind of random. It just kind of comes and goes and flows in and out. Mm-hmm. But I think one of the greatest disservice to just to speak about Jordan for a little bit longer mm-hmm. was that we told kids if you bought his shoes, you would play like him, right? Or if you stuck your tongue out, you mm-hmm. would play like Jordan. Right. And we talk about mastered expression. There is a mindfulness that comes to it. Mm -hmm. So when I think about you in respect to how you engaged your work as an executive assistant, Mm -hmm. there was a massive expression in the combination of that book, right? It wasn't just a job. It wasn't just something you were doing. Mm -hmm. It was a craft. It could be refined. It had power. It had significance. It had influence. And you could master this expression of what we call an executive assistant. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in terms of... um, so your journey to me, even as a dancer, and even in the three, or the three companies you're creating now, um, I find it interesting that one of them is a candle company, right? Okay. And you, when we talked off camera, one of the things you said is, you know, I want people to be, to, to be engaged in, was it conscious giving or yeah. mindful? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. In, a form of, in, in a form of conscious giving. Can you talk about that? Because that is yet another expression that I just want to give a gift to someone. Right. But really kind of bring a consciousness to what is I am giving to this person. So can you talk about that? Absolutely. Um, that's actually around gift suite. Um, I, we, I coined the phrase, or we, I should say, uh, coined the phrase of intentional giving. And uh, the one thing that I, you know, especially from a company that's all about giving gifts, I've just never really, like, for instance, my parents and I, we stopped trading Christmas gifts decades ago just because, and that was my, by my request, um, because I, I felt that I had gone through so many Christmases where I had, you know, spent myself into poverty, <laughs> uh, you know, blew up all my credit cards uh, just to quote unquote express myself with a gift that I'm not, not even sure people would use. I mean, if anything, I was buying something that I really wanted and expecting them to like it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, and I believe, you know, I've always looked you know, at our, an- at our ancestry, for instance, and the idea of when you give a gift, it is, it is a celebration of that person. And, and there's an intention around it in particular that you want to make sure that you've really thought it through, you know, you've kind of done your research or whatever, or you're, you're representing, you know, either your tribe or your brand or whatever else, and you're doing it in such a way where that person will feel how you know, how much effort you put into giving that gift to them. Um, I lived in Japan for about a year, um, year and a half. And same thing. I mean, the the Japanese are just so wonderful. Um, You know, you walk in, I was such a dumb American. (laughs) You walk in, you see something like, oh my God, that is gorgeous. And it's a gift because they see that, Mm -hmm. that it moved you. It affected you somehow. And what better way to give a gift than to give it, give someone something that, that you have, you might actually treasure, but you see how it affected them like viscerally give that as a gift. And I always, I, that always stuck with me. Um, so in, for instance, even with candles, you know, when people buy candles for other people, I, I tell them, I'm like, Hey, you know, it's it, the sense are, it, it'll be a personal expression of course, but I, the candles are more for individuals. I like people to buy candles for themselves more than give them as gifts, to be honest with you, but do your thing. But uh, around the gift sweet thing, I, I really wanted people to, to sort of curate gifts that had a meaning and things that lasted more than just the moment that they're in. You know, I, I am a big believer in putting, for instance, items and boxes that last for years because it will always remind you of how you felt the day that you opened it. And to me, that's, that's, 
and again, a form of expression, you know, <laughs> even as a gift giver, that's a form of expression, mm -hmm. knowing that someone two years from now, you might be on a Zoom call and, you, you know, you see they're picking up the cup that you bought them in that, that box, you know, it's, it's a double-sided um, joy, if you will. You know, the person obviously uh, experiencing it every day because they love it. And then the person recognizing that, hey, I gave you that, you know, that's such a validation. And uh, I think that's, that's really kind of how I, how I have always looked at sort of intentional giving, if you will. You know, it appears that COVID hasn't stopped you, at least from this, from this distance, you know. Mm -hmm. um, how, has it, how has it redefined you? Has it, has it forced you to behave in ways that are new and different, that are positive? Um, and that are surprising to you? I'd say for me, um, not really. I know that may sound kind of like, what? <laughs> but not really. I've always operated in the way that I'm operating now. You know, I, I've always been empathetic. I've always been caring. I've always been highly intuitive, empathic to an extent. Um, so not really. I, I guess more than anything, I'm feeling a bit more empathy toward people who just don't know themselves. You know, luckily, I, I got to a point where I, I know myself incredibly well. And I know, you know, I know what makes me happy and what makes me sad. I know what, you know, will depress me. I know how to get myself out of it, that sort of thing. I'm incredibly self-aware like that. I've mastered expression, you know, uh, that sort of thing. But there are a lot of people who are struggling, who just, they lost touch with who they are. They got pulled into the whole, new, new, you know, United States narrative of, you know, he who dies with the, the most toys wins. And, you know, it's all about the money that you make and it's all about the status that you achieve and all of that. And um, they lost that real, honest, pure, and very simple connection with who they are. And now you see them, they're, they're, they're losing it, absolutely losing it. So if anything, you know, I, I'm much more empathetic to that, but at the same time, I tend to be... <laughs> And this is just my personality for perhaps that's, you know, I can blame my parents or something, but, you know, I don't, I don't like, I don't allow people to wallow in it. You know, if you're going to be around me, you're not going to wallow. We're going to talk about how you can get out of it and we're going to do it. I'm going to give you the steps. I'm going to, you know, give you the accountability that you need and make sure that you're moving forward. That's how I roll. So if anything, it's made me double down on, you know, what made me popular on LinkedIn or <laughs> what made me popular in my coaching circles is, you know, okay, cry, get that, get that out of your system real quick, but let's get to work. You know what I mean? And it's, it's been great. Um, my coaching clients are doing fantastic. Um, it feeds me because I see them go from this, you know, poor me, you know, looking for that sort of negative validation from people and stuff like that. I'm like, miss me with that BS. I don't have time. You know, you want, let's, you want to dig yourself out of this then let's go. And uh, it's been great. So you know, maybe it's made me even more, <laughs> more aggro, but, but, uh, but uh, it's also, you know, been, been, it's been great for me. You know, I have my moments. I admit, you know, I have my moments. I, I hate masks. I'm so sick of masks, but I wear them, you know. <laughs> so that's what I was going to ask you. you yeah. I mean, you know, you're, you're so expressive. And, mm -hmm. You know, you're always engaged. And, yeah. and then the symbolism of putting a mask on, mm -hmm. right? The whole idea of the mask is you know, to kind of his protection, you yeah. know, As someone who um, is always not, it always feels, at least for me, you feel protected, right? Mm -hmm. I, never, I never see you walking into a situation not feeling a sense of being able to protect yourself. Right. And right. Yet, and yet the symbolism of putting this on our face, you know, is it's quite powerful. You know? It is. It is. I, and if anything, for me, I just miss seeing people smile. <laughs> You know, I think that's it, or or being able to sort of mouth, even if it's not audible, just being able to mouth hello or how are you or hey, what's up. Um, I miss that, but um, I don't know. In a weird way, it's it's sort of made me make more eye contact because right. you can see people smiling in their eyes, and you can yeah. see some sort of you know. I think about. Um, um, people who are deaf, for instance, they have to find those cues in non-verbal language, you know, non-audible language. So they're looking for body language. They're looking for what you're saying or what you're expressing with your eyes. And um, for me, I guess me being, you know, that guy and kind of competitive like that, I'm always trying to figure out like, hmm, you know, are you smiling behind your eyes or, or are you dead back there? You know what I mean? That kind of thing. So um, that's, that's, it's been tough though. I, I do miss you know, just a simple smile and seeing people smile, you know, honestly and 
Oh, no. Yeah, it's a different kind of communication because yeah. the eyes is the window to the soul. Very right? much so, and especially and so now. Much, and especially now, so soul. Yeah, know. and it's sad because I think a lot of people's souls are are in peril right now. So I'm seeing a lot of that even when I walk the streets of downtown Los Angeles. I mean, I see a lot of people thinking, you know, they're always thinking. And it's not necessarily about something good. You know, it's, it's survivalized, I call it. You know, there's a lot of survivalized going on, so. You know, it's interesting that, we, that you use that word. I guess it's a word you create. I've not heard that word. I do that, that's my thing. I love, I love it. <laughs> but you know, when you talk about survivalized, I think of George Floyd, mm-hmm. you know. Oh. And, and the yeah. knee, and the knee of this mm-hmm. one's snack. Yeah. And kind of symbolic, uh, you know, kind of representation of mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Um, we usually think that when someone wants to harm us, they have a scowl on their face. Right. And they're kind of with a vengeance. Mm-hmm. And if you look at this officer, he had anything but that. He looked mm-hmm. calm. He looked very much in control of himself. Mm-hmm. He, looked, he looked like, basically, if you didn't show what he was doing from the waist down, mm-hmm. You would assume he was just maybe having a cup of coffee or exactly. just like friends, you know? Exactly. And, and yet when we are trying to survive, you know, um, what is harming us can come in so many different forms mm-hmm. um, that, um, that it doesn't always have to come with a scowl. Right. You know? And for me, the whole idea of Black Lives Matter mm-hmm. came certainly historically with that luck, right? With right. They were chaining you and mm-hmm. bonding you. Yeah. And you we move from that to this guy just looking rather calm and cool mm-hmm. with his knee on the neck of a black man, mm-hmm. sim- symbolizing all kinds of things. Of course. What Black Lives Matter movement impacted you? I think for me, um, I'm encouraged by the, the sort of, you know, very visible show of support by people who weren't necessarily, or, you know, at least not that visibly um, our allies. Um, I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing. Um, being someone of a certain age and having grown up in, you know, post-segregation in Texas, uh, I still have a little side eye. I won't lie. You know, I, I, it's funny that you mentioned how that sort of lack of a scowl mm-hmm. of someone who very casually and quite callously had his hands in his pocket while his hands, while his knee was on someone's neck, literally watching you know probably sensing i mean because we but th- this is the thing and maybe i don't want to go on a, a a digression but this is one of the the things that really stood out about that scene if you will is the fact that one his hands were in his pockets two he didn't have any sort of expression that was like angry so it was hard for me to really kind of like clue in on that and three you know we are very energetic beings so you cannot tell me in any uncertain terms that he didn't know that he was, you know, that the life was literally draining out of this man. You feel that. And especially you had a, a like, it wasn't necessarily skin on skin, but you had a connection where, you know, the pulses literally through your body, the universe or, or just physiology or something would have told you, I should probably knock this off now, you know? So for me, I almost kind of, in a weird way, equate that with a lot of, um, and I know people are going to be like, what? Um, I, I kind of equate that with business um, in a lot of cases. Um, I, I think in a lot of cases, businesses sort of act in the same way, that they have the, the knees on the necks of you know, people of color, women, um, not, obviously not in you know such a, mm-hmm. a obvious oppressive way, but if you think about it, there's a very there's no expression of anger yeah. in my in my in women in in, in anyone else's um, um, sorry lost my word <laughs> I wouldn't say oppression, but just again it's it's one of those things where the whole Black Lives Matter thing where I'm hoping it really does trans, transmit is into business because I believe business is the center of, in a lot of ways, the center of our lives. So if we can literally make a lot of the changes that we're looking for, you know, kind of in the policing system in the judicial system um, and uh, law enforcement in general, um, if we can make a lot of those shifts, very visceral shifts in business, 
business, then a lot of the societal stuff will take care of itself. But I, it's one thing to say, okay, well, let's fix policing. Let's fix, you know, the judicial system. Let's, you know, let clean house on the hill and, you know, create this. But we have to remember that big business is money and money is power and power always finds its way into politics. It's just the way it works. So I think we're almost doing this backward. I think we need to really focus Black Lives Matter and, and you know, all, well, I wouldn't say it all lives matter when I'm going there, but, you know, but, you know really focus uh, attention on creating parity and equality within the business construct. And in a weird way, that will sort of take care of a lot of societal things that we're dealing with. That's really interesting um, because I do a lot of my background in psychotherapy and conflict resolution. Oh, wow. That's nice. I do, a lot of, I do a lot of work with corporate execs as well. Mm-hmm. And when you talk about corporations and organization having their knees on the necks of women and people of color and whoever else, mm-hmm. um, that metaphor was so powerful to me because that's a symbolic of. And, you know, one of the things that struck me when I saw this was that in the video, you don't really see the face of the officer. You really see him almost from here mm-hmm. on down. So it's almost like you could put any face <laughs> on that particular guy. It wasn't until much later, if I remember what I saw, mm-hmm. that I thought it's interesting we're not seeing the face of this man until much later. Mm-hmm. And you see the whole, the whole picture, right. the whole video. Right. And, you, and you see this calm, this, this relaxed. It's resolve. You resolve know. on this yeah. man's face as if, you know, oh yeah, this is, I, and, and, it's, and it's not that he doesn't know what he's doing. Mm-hmm. He's just not angry about it. Right, right, right. right. And so the, the insidious aspect of that, the, the, the diabolical aspect of mm-hmm. that um, is almost incomprehensible. It's almost a word for it. I think, especially from people who are feeling beings, you yeah. know, I think we'll never really know until we literally hear from that man what he was thinking or what he wasn't thinking or, or whatever. I mean, I'm maybe I'm just weird like that and very forensic, but I, I want to know, like, I want to know, like, what possessed you? Like, was there a point where you were just like, um, you know, oh, crap, you know, I've probably gone too far, but well, I can't stop now because then my buddies are going to think this or, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just... Yeah. I, I feel unless until we really hear from him and hopefully he's honest about it, you know, it's hard to really resolve this for anyone. You know, we can only sort of go with the narrative of what we saw, but I'm also a big believer. And, you know, there's, there's sides to the story. I'm not saying there's nothing that will excuse this in my eyes at all ever, but I would love that extra bit of context yeah. so that I, I feel like I can actually close the book, you know? And, uh, so. I've got friends who believe he did it because he could, and for no other reason. It's clear and simple. Yeah. He did it. He knew he was being videoed. It yeah. wasn't that hard. Yeah. And I've got friends who clearly believe um, that he did it because he could. Mm-hmm. And perhaps I was listening to, um, I can't remember her name. She's English. Mm-hmm. And she wrote a book called um, Intimations. Mm-hmm. And um, she talked about not hate, but contempt. Mm-hmm. And well, she said, you know, there's this thing where when you talk to some people who see themselves as enlightened, mm-hmm. well, it's easy for them to say, well, I don't hate anyone, mm-hmm. you know, and they, they really don't, you know, right. but they hold people in contempt, which is a bit more insidious, so you never talk about that. It is. Well, the, and I can talk to you for days. But oh, I can. Yeah, keep going. I don't have to wrap up, but let me just ask you, and I, I just want some clarification. About sure. That. You talk quite a bit about feeling your way through business and feeling your way through your life. Mm-hmm. Um, I want you to talk about, d- define that a little bit more in the event there is a teenager or a college student watching this. Mm-hmm. They have a definition of how you're using the word feeling within yeah. a business construct right. and how to navigate one's life. So can you be a little bit more definitive? Uh, absolutely. I'd say, you know, and I, I love uh, uh, speaking um, to college students and uh, and young kids or whatever else, because that's one of the things that isn't really taught. You know, we're almost sort of um, discouraged from believing that, you know, things don't necessarily have to have answers and that you can feel your way uh, to to a solution. Um, I'd say the one thing that, that I would sort of hope that people would get, of course, do your homework, 
you know, learn, and I don't mean literally just do your homework, but I mean, do all of your homework, learn and master from an analytical perspective, everything be, that you can. Be actually curious. 100%. Be curious and really kind of dive into what it is and master what it is that you have control over. But also remember that you still have to cross the street. And at some point in your lifetime, probably daily, you're going to get a feeling of, I should probably wait a beat. Even though the light is green for me, the little man is illuminated, I just get a sense. And sure enough, out of the corner of your eye, you see someone who is texting on their phone and blows through an intersection. How many times in your life has that happened? So, you know, maybe I'm what I like to call like an intuition merchant, meaning I would love people to really get in tune and to believe in and to really um, empower their intuition and, and, and validate how it's kept them safe throughout their lives. And how, isn't it funny when you go with your gut, you're never wrong. It's when you don't go with your gut and you fight against, it, you know, an, an intuition that things kind of go, you know, haywire. So, you know, that's what I talk about when I say feel. It's like, you know, in a business construct, yes, learn it all. You know, learn what you need to know and make sure you master it as much as possible. But, you know, once you get comfortable with that, really start relying more on your intuition because it's probably right. And from that intuition, which is, you know, sort of informed by all, all that you've learned, it, it will just, it'll make you soar. It'll just make you so good at decision-making. You'd be shocked. And, and my thing is, it doesn't necessarily have to have an explanation all the time. You just go with your gut. And a lot of things have happened where when you go with your gut, it's, it just works out. I want to thank you for hanging out with me. There's Absolutely. So much you about. Um, tell us the name of your book, where we can get it. Sure. Uh, the book is called As I See It, Volume 1 Business. Uh, and it's, it's available on Amazon.com. And the name of the companies that you're engaged in? I'm yeah. in, uh, uh, so three companies, giftsuite.com, um, gift, G-I-F-T, suite, S-U-I-T-E, uh, Nix and Bo, N-I-X and B-O-W, and uh, Tribe, which is, you know, thismytribe.com. So T-I-T-H-I-S, um, my tribe, T-R-I-B-E.com. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. I've had the pleasure of speaking with the master, the, 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 the multi-talented Phoenix Norman. Did I pronounce that correctly? You did. <laughs> okay, perfect. Phoenix, it's a pleasure. Thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you, Alex. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Interiors on the Bella V platform. We'll be live on YouTube within a week. This will be posted there for your viewing. When you go, do hit subscribe um, and uh, hit like because um, we need you to do that. And of course, the content we have there is quite amazing. Um, and keep watching. Thank you, Amanda Camellia, for creating this platform, and we will see you all at a later time. Keep watching.